Reliability and validity each have two types, internal and external. And I'm going to talk about them each individually with some examples. Internal reliability means that the tool is consistent within itself. So if it was a list of questions on a survey, all of the items would be measuring the same concept. They would be similar to each other. External reliability instead means is the tool consistent across other conditions? If you take this survey when you are sleepy, if you take it one day and then take it six months later, if you take it when you're hungry versus when you're full, are you going to get similar results even when the conditions and the context are a little bit different? Let's look at an example. Is this scale internally reliable? Imagine that I created this questionnaire, this list of items to measure whether you like cake. And I asked you to rate your agreement on a scale of one to five on the following items. Cake is delicious. Of all the dessert foods, I like cake the best. If I had to decide between pie and cake, I would pick cake. And cookies are my favorite dessert. Pause it for a moment here. Take the survey below to let me know whether you think this scale is internally reliable or not. To get the answer, you can take that quiz real quick and then come back for the rest of the lecture. We have ways of measuring internal reliability. Now, it is mathematical, but hold the phone. Don't freak out. You're not going to have to calculate Cronbox Alpha in this class, okay? So Cronbox Alpha is a measure to the extent to which the questions in the same questionnaire are measuring the same thing. It's a measure of internal reliability or internal consistency. You won't need to calculate Cronbox Alpha, but you might read about other scientists' questionnaires and they will report a Cronbox Alpha to tell you how reliable their questionnaire is. And you need to decide when you look at that number whether it's a good one or not. You really don't want to use a scale that has anything under 0.7 of, on Cronbox Alpha. Don't use any questionnaires that have such low reliability. They're not very reliable. The That's sort of like our that's sort of like our cake questionnaire issue where we had one question that stood out from the rest and was not measuring the same concept. So uh, 0.9 is extremely excellent, very reliable, um, potentially redundant, right? If your questionnaire is actually this reliable, you could probably get rid of a few items because they're all asking the same thing so similar to each other. You could probably remove a few items so that your participants could take a shorter questionnaire still measuring the same concept. 0.8 is very good and strong. 0.8 to 0.9, we'd love to see that. 0.7, eh, we don't like to use those in clinical or educational contexts as much, but if they're just for research purposes, um, those are okay. 0.6 and below is not great. I see 0.65s and 0.69s and stuff like that reported in research, but they're not the best. And then 0.6 or below is not reliable and you do not want to use it. So you could think about these numbers almost like percentages, sort of like grades. If you assign these letter grades, the 0.9 and up is an A. We super like that. 0.8 the point eights is a B, etc. So point six and below is failing. External reliability is when we have consistency from one situation to another one. So we're asking ourselves, did we find the same result on different days and in different settings? There are two types of this we're going to look at. One is called test retest reliability, which we've already talked about. And we'll also discuss inter-rater reliability. Let's look at an example of test retest reliability. Let's think about high school seniors taking the SAT or the standardized tests for college admissions that y'all have in Texas or even the ACT, any of those college admissions tests. Students would take the same test on different occasions, maybe to see if they could get a higher score later. And a high correlation between their test scores indicates that the test has good external reliability. If they take the test under different conditions and at different times and they get very close to the same score, we say we have good test retest reliability. Like if these kids took the test again six months later and got a very similar score. Now, that would only be if they had not studied and learned more in that amount of time and become better test takers. So if their true score, which we can't ever actually measure, if their true score of uh, how much they know on these college admissions tests stays the same, if they didn't learn any more in those six months, 
then the test should give them around the same score both times, and then it would have high reliability. We also have what's called inter-rater reliability. In observational studies, that is when you have multiple researchers who are going to be looking at the same thing and they're going to be coding it and counting it. And if those researchers code and count the same thing that they're looking at in the same way, we would say we have high inter-rater reliability. So this would be for studies in which you are looking at pictures, where, where you are videotaping participants, you're watching them in some kind of natural environment. These are the types of measurements you're going to do on your observational project. So let's look at an example. Imagine you needed to categorize this woman's facial expression. She has some aspects of a smile, so she has some of these sort of parentheses around her mouth, and the corners of her mouth are going up, sort of, but if you look at that top lip, it's actually kind of straight across. So she has the hint of a smile, but there's also no hint of smile around her eyes. None of those like crow's feet crinkles you get from a big genuine smile. That mouth movement could go several different ways. She could be in the middle of saying something. So it might not be a smile at all. It might not indicate happiness. It could be kind of a fake smile. It could be a real smile and that's just how she smiles. It could mean a lot of different things. It could be the beginnings of a disgust-based facial expression, which involves the upper lip moving upward somewhat. So if your job was to categorize this, this ambiguous or unclear facial expression, you would want to have high inter-rater reliability. What you would do is get multiple researchers to look at this without talking to each other yet to code what they think this facial expression is. And then kind of the head of the research team, the principal investigator, would look at the two or multiple, you want to have at least two though, they would look at the two ratings from the different raters and if they are similar to each other, if both people agreed this was a fake smile, for example, then we could say we had high inter-rater reliability. Now, when researchers don't find high inter-rater reliability, what they do is sometimes change their measurement. They might say, uh, let's throw this one out and, and study a different face. <laughs> this isn't what exactly we're looking for. It's too ambiguous. Or another thing they might do is bring those independent, previously independent raters together and say, okay, I found some inconsistencies here. One of y'all said this was kind of a disgusted face. One of you said she looked anxious. You, you said that she was faking a smile. So what do we do about this? Let's discuss why we rated things differently and see if we can come to some kind of agreement. You will see numbers like Cronbach's alpha, which shows internal consistency. You will also see in research papers about questionnaires, things like test, retest reliability, like we talked about. And in observational studies that you read about, you're also going to find measures of inter-rater reliability. So what you're going to get for inter-rater reliability, you'll see a number between zero and one that, that indicates the correlation between rater one's rating and rater two's ratings. And if it's high, close to one, like 0.95, we have great inter-rater reliability. That's what we're looking for. If it's lower, again, we would go back and do this rating process again, maybe with different pictures and we would get together and talk about it and make make it so that eventually our score would agree a little better. So keep an eye out for these types of reliability when you start reading research articles in your topic area.